Hey, Tyler, have you ever wanted to make your own podcast? Absolutely, I have. Well, if you want to make your podcast, you should go to Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Here's why. For one, it's free to use, no monthly fees. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so you don't need any of that special equipment. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If Jeff and I can make a podcast using Anchor, literally anybody can. So, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The following podcast is a member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out PokeCastersNetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 21 of the Pokemon Snapshot. Hi Tyler, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm pretty fantastic. I'm not looking forward that it's Sunday and tomorrow's Monday, but what can you do? I did have three snow days last week, though. Well, that's nice. It snowed a little here, not much. And we do want to apologize for not having an episode out last week. I'm sorry, Tyler has it written in his contract that after every 20 episodes, he needs to take a week off. Yeah, that's totally what happened. Because I have a contract. Speaking of contracts, we need to get one of those because I have not seen a dime of our money yet, Jeff. Me neither. But going on, if you want to contact us, remember you can always tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot, or you can email us at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. And Tyler, I think we're ready to get into the episode. Before we get into the episode, Jeff, I did want to talk about an exciting piece of uh, Pokemon news. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? McDonald's. Is it February? Yeah, so February 27th is the 25th anniversary of Pokemon. Right. So in February, they're going to be running at McDonald's in Happy Meals a promotion where you can get four limited edition holo cards from the first gen of Pokemon in every Happy Meal. And I'm pretty excited about this. So are they all guaranteed to be holo or one of the four will be holo? I'm not totally sure on that. I just saw that you get the chance to get them hollow. I'm assuming probably that, you know, there'll be like one hollow a pack or something like that. Well, that's exciting. I know I have my Pokemon cards around in my room somewhere around here. Not sure where, but I'm sure I could dig them up. Yeah, I was telling Jeff that I needed to borrow his kid so I didn't look like a weirdo going to McDonald's and ordering 18 Happy Meals. But, you know, what can you do? Just bring your dog. I'll bring my dog. I'll, like, pull up in the drive-thru and be like, Kids! Uh, how many Happy Meals do we need to get? Oh, that's 18. That's right. I need 18 Happy Meals. And then yeah. just... And, and then I'll have, like, my windows tinted, because I'm in Nebraska and I can do that. And uh, hopefully they won't notice my ruse. Please videotape this as you go through, because I want to see this. Okay, that sounds good. I'll try to videotape it. Maybe we'll put it up on the uh, Facebook page. All right, so now let's get into our episode, but yeah, that's super exciting, and I am super excited. I can't believe Pokemon's 25 years old. I can't either. We're getting old, Jeff. Yeah, granted, it did not come out till 1998 in the United States, so it's a couple years before we would see Pokemon, which is really crazy to think. Could you imagine if a Pokemon game nowadays came out before, like in Japan, before they hit here? Yeah, no, I can't. It was very weird. Yeah, I remember, I think it was Pokemon X and Y is where they actually advertised it's the first time that Pokemon games were coming out the same date in Japan and in the United States. Right. So, uh, what a time to be alive. It is a great time to be alive, Jeff. All right, so let's get into this episode. And as I said at the beginning, uh, this is episode 21, and it is titled Bye Bye Butterfree. Which in Japanese, it was also titled Bye Bye Butterfree. It aired on August 19th, 1997 in Japan and on October 5th, 
1998 in the United States. All right, Tyler, let's get into the episode. Let's do this. We begin our episode with Ash and his party walking down a path looking towards a rock cliff by the sea. They look over it, and Ash says, Wow, that is a long drop. And Missy responds by saying, Fall from here, and ball game's over. And I love how the physics in this show works, because they've definitely fallen from higher heights than that before and been just fine. In fact, I should start keeping track of the number of times that they should have died in this show thus far. It has been over 10 at this point, and if we go at a rate of once every other episode, give or take, I I would say that that's probably a pretty good educated guess. Yeah, and I thought the same thing, and I actually in my notes put, you know, just within a couple episodes of each other, Brock fell off that broken bridge. Right. And then Ash fell off a bridge into River Rapids. Right, he did. Like, he definitely could have broken his back or something. Yeah, absolutely. And and these two instances were very close together. I mean, Brock was during the Charmander episode and Ash was during the Squirtle episode. Right, yep. So they fell off these bridges very close together. And so I don't think falling into the ocean would have affected them that much. No. Maybe they just haven't figured that out yet. Like, we don't want them to know that they're technically invincible. At this point, Brock pulls out a map. Thank God they finally took that away from Ash. And looks down a path going alongside the rock wall cliff. Brock says that this path should lead to Saffron City, where their next gym challenge is located. And there's something I thought was very interesting. Because usually the anime follows the same route as the game's. But for some reason, in season one, they chose to change the order of the gems. They go from Saffron City to Celadon City and then to Fuchsia City. While in the games, you are supposed to go Celadon City, Fuchsia City, and then Saffron City. That's right. Yep, they messed that up. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Like, why would you change it? Maybe, and it doesn't really, if I remember correctly, it doesn't affect the story that much. So I don't know. I sometimes get the feeling that they had, like, one initial meeting over drinks with the people that made the Pokemon game. They got some good notes down, but not everything quite lines up. (laughs) That, That is a very good possibility. Just then, however, Ash notices a bunch of Butterfree flying around in the sky above the cliff face. Brock says that the Butterfree are celebrating their season of love. He explains that the Butterfree get together to choose a mate and they lay eggs across the sea. Ash responds by asking about his Butterfree, and Brock explains that if his Butterfree doesn't cross the sea, it will never have babies. Did we really need to talk about Butterfree making babies? Probably not, no. Yeah, this is a kid's show. (laughs) Come on. There are better ways they could have handled this throughout the entire episode. At this point, the scene changes and we see Ash and his party sitting in a hot air balloon that is on the ground. Misty comments that they were lucky that they found one for rent out there. Are you telling me that I couldn't even rent a car until I was, I think, either 24 or 25 and these kids could just waltz up and rent a hot air balloon? I am sure that the hot air balloon was rental. I'm sure that the hot air balloon rental company's insurance definitely would not like this. I also thought that this was really ridiculous, especially if the person renting out the hot air balloon knew their track record. I mean, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and they didn't steal the vehicle this time. It's true, they didn't steal it, but there's a pretty good chance that this hot air balloon is not going to be functioning by the time they they return it. Brock pulls the cord on the hot air balloon, and they begin to sail into the sky. They float over the ocean, marveling at the view as they follow the crowd of Butterfree out over the ocean. They see the Butterfree are pairing up into couples. Ash decides to release his Butterfree to join in on the adult activities that these Butterfree are about to partake in. Butterfree flies around to the various Butterfree, but none of them will pick it to be its mate. And this cuts deep, Jeff. Like, it's like a Pokemon anime representation of our dating lives in college. And high school. And even for a little while after college. I'm glad you included yourself in this as well. (laughs) Hey, I wasn't as bad off as you, but yeah, we were both pretty bad off. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, no problem. But you did get married before me, so you won in the long run. I did, like four months? Yeah, four months or so. You beat me to it by just a smidge. 
Just then, we see a bunch of other hot air balloons come flying out over the water, and various Pokemon trainers begin to release their Butterfree to get in on the action. Brock explains that they come every year to release their Butterfree for this. Just then, Brock notices another trainer who he thinks is cute and begins to act all weird like usual. He calls over Ash's Butterfree and tells it to pick the one that that girl just released. So basically, he's like, go get that Butterfree that this cute girl just released, all the while still acting really weird. Does he not remember the last time he fell in love with a random girl? It appears he got over that whole almost getting possessed like in the exorcist situation. Butterfree seems confused and Brock tells it that if Butterfree fall in love, then the trainers will have to meet and he too then can fall in love. Misty promptly hits Brock over the head to snap him out of it. Then Ash tells Misty that if Butterfree never finds a mate, it won't have babies. And Misty agrees. They both send Butterfree off back into the dating pool. I thought this was interesting because Brock isn't even Butterfree's trainer. I know. He clearly did not think this through. He doesn't even really, like, interact with his Pokemon, though, so maybe he, like, by proxy thinks he's training Ash's Pokemon. I don't know. True, yeah, his Pokemon just kind of sit in their Pokeballs. He brings them out very rarely. Yeah, it's been, like, what, a handful of times, if even? Maybe, like, two or three times? Butterfree, undeterred, flies back into the crowd of Butterfree and falls head over heels for a pink Butterfree. He flies up to it. So, I want to note that this is the first instance where a different coloration is used, and this was before shiny Pokemon were a thing. So, you've heard of shiny Pokemon, right, Tyler? Of course, yeah, I definitely play the games. Yeah, so, a shiny Pokemon, if you don't know, is a very rare chance to get a different coloration of Pokemon. Now, Butterfree's is not pink. I believe it just changes the color of its eyes. I tried to look, I looked it up, and I think that's what I saw. Um... But they're very rare to find. I think it's like 1 in 32,000 chances or 1 in 8,000 or something like that. Yeah, I've been playing Pokemon for decades and I don't specifically hunt for shinies. So, Me neither. So I've, I've maybe gotten a few just by accident. I've never had a shiny Pokemon show up. <gasps> yeah, and we'll say I've played more than Tyler. I don't hunt them out. There are ways you can raise your chances. I don't deal with that. I just play through the games. Um, I guess I do have one shiny Pokemon. I do have a shiny Swablu in Pokemon uh, Go. So Okay, so you do have one. But yeah. I do have one, but Pokemon Go they're easier to find too. Right. Yeah, they're they're exceedingly rare is the overall point. Like we've been playing a long time and there are not many shinies between the two of us. But there are yeah. people that specifically hunt for shinies. I have yeah. a friend that does that. Yeah, and it's uh, more power to them. I just don't have the willpower or the patience to do it but as i said butterfree shiny is not pink but when we get to the orange islands we will see an island where all the pokemon are pink it's called pink and island so we i mean of course this was before they even wrote the orange island or or thought of it or thought of it so because it wasn't even a game the orange islands um but so i guess we can say that this poke this butterfree comes from pink and island and the orange islands that's what we're gonna assume then butterfree flies up to this pink butterfree and begins to fluttering around weirdly around it and brock explains that this is a courtship dance used to attract a mate thank god humans don't have courtship dances they need to do or i would be doomed (laughs) he says the other butterfree will do a dance if it accepts But things don't go so well for old Butterfree as usual. The pink one tries to fly away, and it follows, only to get smacked in the face. Butterfree gets rejected hard. Ash and his party are very disappointed and sad for Butterfree. I guess Butterfree won't be making babies, which I want to bring is weird how often this was brought up during this episode. Right, many, many times they're like, making babies. Yeah, they're like, Butterfree needs to make babies. Oh, Butterfree, you need to go make babies. They didn't say mate. They didn't say court. They just kept saying making babies. Right. I spent 32 years not thinking about Pokemon sex, and here we are. Here we are, Jeff. It's going to be on your mind the rest of the day, and maybe the rest of the week. Yeah, and granted, I have seen this episode before, but I've never sat and analyzed these episodes, so I never realized how often it was brought up during the episode. Right, yeah, it's it's a lot. Butterfree, after being rejected hard and smacked in the face, uh, is devastated. He flies away crying into the forest below. 
Ash and the party land in the forest, and they're calling out for Butterfree looking for it. Eventually, they spot Butterfree sitting by a tree, all upset. Ash asks if it is okay, and it makes a sad wee noise. He then asks why it is sad, as if this isn't incredibly obvious. Brock responds by saying that it is upset, no dir, because it was rejected and laments and he could and, and laments that he could write a book um about the secrets of love and heartache. So Brock is like, oh, he's just upset, and then he like starts going on a whole tangent about how he's rejected constantly too, and so he knows how Butterfree feels, says that he could write a book on the secrets of love and heartache, and Misty guesses that this book would be his autobiography autobiography, and of course Brock gets more sad. That was a great burn. It was a great burn. Definitely a great burn. Pikachu begins trying to console Butterfree while Ash ponders whether Dexter, the Pokédex, will be able to tell them how they can help Butterfree get a mate. Misty says that won't work. Which is weird because I'm sure Dexter has something about Butterfree mating rituals. I mean, it is an encyclopedia after all. Right, it definitely would have had some information in there. Ash then begins to say that Butterfree is great and he doesn't understand why it has been rejected. He suggests that Butterfree just needs to show off its strengths. Missy tells Butterfree that it needs to be assertive and says, Love is all about attacking your opponents first. Get in quick, punch, and then and surprise them. Then, while they are still weak, take the lead and you'll beat them hands down. Trust me, I know. That's the best way to win. Suddenly, I'm a little concerned that Misty may or may not be a serial killer that preys on young men. And I'm pretty sure this tactic will not work in the times we are in. No, definitely not. She would have been me too'd off the Twitterverse. <laughs> Brock says, Brock, after hearing Misty's little tirade, goes, Wow, I wish I had known all of this sooner. No, Brock, don't listen to that. That is terrible advice. Brock then says that a new look will help Butterfree, and he begins to tie an ascot onto Butterfree. It's like a yellow ascot around his neck. They all agree that it looks great, and it does not look great. I'm surprised you used the word ascot. I was just thinking it was a ribbon. Oh, it was an ascot, and the reason I know it's an ascot is because of Scooby-Doo, the original series. They used to mention Fred's ascot all the time, so from a young age, I was familiar with what ascots were, and briefly contemplated that they might be a good idea for me to wear, only for my mother to assure me that they were not. I wish I could have, I wish I would have met ascot wearing Tyler. Well, Tyler never got to wear an ascot because he was, he was, uh, told he was not allowed to. You should try it now. I I mean, I could. I don't really have anything to lose at this point. With its new super stylish ascot, Butterfree flies back into the crowd, with Ash and his group following behind in a hot air balloon. They begin looking for this pink Butterfree again, because apparently they can't take no for an answer. This group is really giving me an old guy at a college bar with a handlebar mustache and a leather jacket vibe. Um, You know, the kind that won't stop following around college girls. That's That's the vibe that they're giving me. And I think that Pokemon needs to, like, get its advice on healthy relationships in check, by the way, too. Yeah, either having someone abuse you is okay or not taking no for an answer. I mean, this doesn't seem like that long ago, but man, these are different times. Oh, yeah. yeah I can't even imagine if this series would have come out the way it's written now. We would not know Pokemon for very long. <laughs> It'd be gone. It would be canceled. Literally canceled on TV. But also cancel cultured. Yes, for sure. Ash comments that he raised Butterfree and he wants everyone to know how great it is. Just then, he spots the pink Butterfree again. Ash's Butterfree flies up and begins demonstrating its various attacks that it knows. So it's like flying around in the air, like doing its little attacks like tackle and wing flappy thing. But it doesn't have any effect and the pink Butterfree shoots it down again. Ash and his party are upset that Butterfree has been shot down yet again. However, before they can react, we see Team Rocket helicopter fly up in fly up into like the group of hot air balloons. And and I just want to say that this is probably the longest we have gone in quite some time without Team Rocket around, and it was it's been kind of nice. Those three annoy me. Team Rocket begins to do its little poem thing over the intercom of their helicopter. They announce that their plan is to capture all of the Butterfree and they drop a giant net down from the bottom of the helicopter. And then it goes into a commercial break, and that is where we are going to go into our Who's That Pokemon segment. Who's That Pokemon? 
All right, so our Who's That Pokemon for this week is Butterfree. I'm which, shocked. Yeah, which in Japanese is called Butterfree, so he didn't get a name change. Uh, he's number 12 in the Pokedex. He's bug flying type. Height of 3 foot 7 inches. Weigh 70.5 pounds. And is known as the Butterfly Pokemon. And he does not evolve as he is a fine... He is a final evolution, but he does have a Gigantamax form. All right, Butterfree's name origin. Butterfree may be a combination of butterfly and free, possibly referring to its ability to fly after being grounded for two evolutionary stages. Uh, What is Butterfree based off of? Butterfree appears to be based on the black-veined white butterfly. Uh, And then Gigantamax Butterfree may be inspired by the Kaiju Mothra. All right, Butterfree's biology. Butterfree resembles a vaguely anthropomorphic butterfly with a purple body. Unlike true insects, it only has two body segments and four light blue legs. The upper pair of legs resemble small three-fingered hands, while the lower pair resemble long digitless feet. Butterfree has two black antenna, a light blue snout with two fangs underneath, and a large red compound eyes. The red compound eyes at, at a closer look are revealed to be a myriad of tiny eyes. Its two pairs of wings are white with black venation. Two oval scales on a female butterfly, butterfree's lower wings are black and they are white on a male's. As Gigantamax Butterfree, its size increases to gigantic length with an altered look. The wings in its patterns changes to light and dark green color with white. The antennae changes to bright green and extend to the point where the tip bends and the three red clouds surround it. The eyes change to a bright glowing red. A fur-like circle is attached to both the wings and back of Butterfree. Several green scales can be seen floating around Butterfree, which are its most effective weapons. Capable of releasing paralysis, poisoning, or sleep, the scales were created from crystallized Gigantamax energy. Alright, the Pokedex entry for Butterfree. Red and blue states, in battle, it flaps its wings at high speed to release a highly toxic dust into the air. Which we've seen a lot of from the show. Oh yeah, we've seen a ton of that. Like, every time Butterfree comes out, he drops that trick. Yep. Uh, Pokemon Yellow says, its wings covered with poisonous powders repel water. This allows it to fly in the rain. Uh, Ruby and Sapphire state, Butterfree has a superior ability to search for delicious honey from flowers. It can even search out, extract, and carry honey from flowers that are blooming over six miles from its nest. And then I do have a Gigantamax Pokedex entry from Pokemon Shield, and it says, Once it has opponents trapped in a tornado that could blow away a ten-ton truck, it finishes them off with its poisonous scales. That's actually the most terrifying thing I've ever heard related to a Butterfree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's Gigantamax Pokemon, so remember they are huge, the size of buildings. Right. So yeah, so a Gigantamax Butterfree can blow away a 10-ton truck. Why are we allowing people to battle with them? I don't know. Good thing that they need to be part of a trainer, but could you imagine, like, Team Rocket getting a hold of a Gigantamax Pokemon and just wreaking havoc? Well, and not only that, in this in the region that they have Gigantamax Pokemon, they're battling in stadiums. That just yeah. seems like a terrible idea. Yeah, if if one if one move hits, that like that's a section of your audience gone. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, oh, Gigantamax Pikachu dodges Gigantamax Gimanta blah <laughs> dodges Gigantamax tornado that can blow over a ten ton truck and just smashes into a crowd of hundreds of people. Yeah, that is not scary. That is, I mean, that is not good. That is really scary. But, so, that is our Who's That Pokemon for this week. Who's That Pokemon? Wow, that was a really fancy Who's That Pokemon, by the way. You dropped a couple of really big words in the descriptions of Butterfree. I was, like, furiously flipping through the dictionary. Like, what is this? (laughs) Anthropomorphic? There's, like, one word that you said, like, anthropomorphic? I don't even know. Um. I don't know. I have to look through what I said, but... Oh, Butterfree resembles a vaguely anthropomorphic butterfly. Yeah, that one. That was fancy. I was, like, taken aback. I'm like, I've never heard Jeff sound so smart. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Anyway, we come back to our episode, and Team Rocket has made their grand entrance on their helicopter, and they have dropped a giant net from the bottom of the helicopter in order to, what I assume, capture all the Butterfree. They begin to scoop up the Butterfree and giggle as they do. Brock yells that they are ruining the egg laying, and Ash says that they need to stop them. Good job, Ash. Good, uh, good, good, uh, thing to point out there. As Ash and the party yell at them from their balloon, and Team Rocket says, we are, uh, as they're yelling at them from the balloon, because apparently that's what they're going to do to stop them, Team Rocket says, we are having quite a spree, capturing all the Butterfree. There has never been a happier me. Ash and his party, <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I, I was kind of taken aback by that. I'm like, all right, I guess we're rhyming now. Ash and his party try to chase them in the balloon, but the chopper is too fast, and they continue to scoop up Butterfree left and right. Just then, however, Ash's Butterfree flies in and begins attempting to headbutt the chopper, the, the chopper like doing a tackle, I guess. Um, Ash is cheering as this happens, but it doesn't seem to have any effect. Butterfree then tries to stun Spore, but the blades of the chopper just blow it away. James laughs and says, that was a stunning failure. <sighs> okay. All right, surely another trainer could hop in and help at this point. Yeah, there's like 75 of them there. Like... There's a ton of hot air balloons floating around. Yeah, and also, what did Ash think the stun spore was going to do? I, I'm assuming that his plan was to, like, stun Jesse and James as they were flying the helicopter or something. So, yeah, let's put bring out that point. Stun, just, stun the people driving a helicopter that is holding everyone's Pokemon. Ah, yes, I see where you're going with this. So then the helicopter would crash into the ocean, killing all the Butterfree in the net. Yeah, or as he's throwing out the stun spore, he's lucky that the stun spore didn't fly back and hit all the other people in the hot air balloons, and then they're crashing into each other. Wow, this could have been a real disaster. I did not pick <laughs> up on that. Good job, Ash. Yeah, that this was just not smart. No, but then again, what is... What are, I mean, you could use that to describe many things that Ash does. But yeah, that was particularly bad. I did not pick up on that. Ash then yells out it, that he guesses that he is going to have to send out Pidgeotto. So after his terrible plan that could have killed everybody uh, fails, he decides to send out Pidgeotto. However, Misty tells him that he can't do that because it would make Butterfree sad, and it is trying its hardest. Ash agrees not to send out Pidgeotto. So, I'm pretty sure Ash always used other Pokemon instead of Butterfree, so why should this be any different? <laughs> That's for sure. That's like his attack plan. It's like, let's use anything but Butterfree. With Butterfree's feeble attempt to stop them continuing, Jesse says that it is time to get out of there since they have captured the Butterfree that they needed. So, they've scooped up all the Butterfree in a net. They begin to fly away, and Butterfree chases after them. Ash and the party follow as well, but they lose sight of them over what appears to be a mountain range. They all shout for Butterfree, but cannot seem to find them. Just then, however, they do spot a battered-up Butterfree. Butterfree flies up and says that it knows where Team Rocket is, and Ash tells it to lead the way. Again, no one else seems to care about their Pokemon. Ash and company are the only ones trailing them. Right. All the rest of the trainers are just like, Well, guess we're not going to get to see our Pokemon adult theme party today. And they just like continue to float around. That must be it. They must have been like, well, we were releasing them everywhere. They were on their own. Yeah, they're on, they're gone. I already said my goodbyes, probably to sweet <laughs> 90s uh, soap opera music. We then change scenes to a building in the mountains where Team Rocket has landed their chopper and they are counting off the Butterfree that they have captured. They congratulate one another on what a great catch they have made. They also talk about how great it is that one of their plans has actually worked for once. Meowth imagines how nice it will be to be the boss's favorite. Just then, however, the windows break out in the building and Ash and his party jump in. They do a short, changed version of the Team Rocket poem thing. Team Rocket gets disappointed and mentions how this all seemed too good to be true. I, I agree with you, Team Rocket. This did seem too good to be true. Like, this whole thing just seemed to go be going flawlessly until they tried to make their horrible escape by flying, like, you know, 20 minutes away. <laughs> Ash has Butterfree attack, and it begins to do tackle attacks at Team Rocket. As this happens, Misty actually helps for once and sends out Starmie. Starmie begins to chase Team Rocket. 
So what you're saying is it's not okay for Ash to send out his Pokemon, but Misty can send out Starmie? Misty being hypocritical is not an unusual thing. So yes, probably. She's like, no, don't send out Pokemon to help. Five minutes later, Starmie, go! Good job, Misty. As this is happening, Butterfree begins tackling into the net, which seems like a terrible strategy, honestly. And as it is using tackle, you can tell that the pink Butterfree is beginning to fall madly in love with it. It's like, oh, wow, look at this hunk of a Butterfree tackling a net in order to release us. Wow, this is so awesome. I'm going to I'm gonna date this Butterfree and mate with it and make babies and all that stuff. And it's like, can't you guys, like, cut the net or something? I don't know. Eventually, the net breaks open and all the Butterfree begin to pour out of it. This startles Team Rocket and Jesse promptly hits Starmie with a sledgehammer. Starmie flies into the wall. That sledgehammer shot was brutal. That was very brutal. She she turns around and literally, I mean, hammers Starmie with a sledgehammer. It was crazy. Misty sprays Starmie with a water gun, which wakes it up again, and Brock opens the door to release the Butterfree. Team Rocket tries desperately to capture some of the Butterfree with their nets, but they seem to be failing. As this happens, Ash walks up to Butterfree, and his Butterfree looks rather beat up, probably from body slamming into a net for 20 minutes to try and free all these other Butterfree. Ash asks if it's okay. Just then, however, the pink Butterfree flies up also to check on them, and James comes up and tries to capture it. But just as he raises his net to capture this beautiful pink Butterfree, Ash's Butterfree tackles James out of the way. At this point, we see Team Rocket hopping into the chopper to begin chasing all the Butterfree that have been released. It appears that they have not given up hope just yet. Ash and his party chases in their balloon as Team Rocket drops their net again. So they're going to they're gonna drop their net and they're going to scoop up all these Butterfree who are just flying in a cloud back towards this one specific spot, apparently, where they just have to mate. Just then, Pikachu jumps up on Butterfree's back and they begin to fly towards the chopper. Pikachu jumps off of Butterfree and onto the helicopter as they get close. He shocks the helicopter, and this actually causes it to explode. Team Rocket falls into the mountain range below, disappearing from sight. Butterfree catches Pikachu, and they fly back to the balloon. So we are finally rid of Team Rocket. They had a good plan going, but then they failed again, as usual, because they did not secure a good exit strategy. Always have a good exit strategy, people. Ash congratulates Pikachu, and the bunk- and the pink Butterfree flies up to Ash's Butterfree and begins doing the courtship dance. They fly around happily with one another. So it appears that uh, Ash's Butterfree's attempts to tackle a net open, or to tackle a net until it breaks, uh, has wooed this pink Butterfree that wanted nothing to do with him twice before. We then change scenes to Ash and his party standing on the cliffside at sunset with both Butterfree stood before them. It appears that Butterfree is about to leave with its new mate and cross the ocean. Ash says goodbye to his Butterfree and says that he will tell the other Pokemon that it has gone on a trip and will come back someday. So is Ash here just trying not to explain the Pidgeys and the Beedrills to his other Pokemon? Absolutely. He definitely does not want to explain what's actually going on. Like, can you imagine that? He just, like, releases all of his Pokemon. He's like, look, guys. Uh, Butterfree left because it is going to uh, go have adult relations with another Butterfree to make babies. And then and then that's going to explain the whole... And then that's going to turn into a whole thing. So, yeah, I can see why he's trying to avoid that. Everyone is really sad as this is happening, but Butterfree and its mate fly off over the ocean with emotional 90s soap opera music playing. Ash Ash reminisces once again on his one good time that he had with Butterfree, the part where it evolved into Butterfree. The Pokemon theme then begins to start to play as we see recaps of the two battles that Butterfree has ever been in. And I imagine that they really had to dig hard for footage for this scene because Butterfree has not done much. Basically, it's like an entire montage to the Pokemon opening theme where Butterfree is like flying into other Pokemon. And it's like the same two Pokemon in every scene because, of course, that was the only time it battled. Yeah, I'm actually happy that they found more than just one scene. I mean, one of the scenes was just a Butterfree just eating some food. 
Yeah, they should. They had to. They had to find footage of Butterfree somehow. So they picked the one where Butterfree was eating food uh, with that creepy scientist guy that wanted to fly into space with some Clefairy. Yeah. So that was. So we got to see Seymour again. That was great. Uh, and I also thought it was weird what they chose to do with the music there because they started with a nice instrumental version, then it randomly started singing and went into vocals, and then it quit singing and went back to instrumentals, and then ended with singing again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I I got the feeling during this entire sequence that they were struggling. They're like, oh my god, we have to find a way to make this a super emotional goodbye for a Pokemon that has been spotted maybe three times the entire series. After this goes down, Ash waves goodbye and says that he will always remember his Butterfree. Butterfree looks back sadly and continues to fly on. Ash says, be happy, old friend, as Misty comments on how beautiful this whole thing is. The narrator comments that by helping Butterfree grow, Ash has grown a little himself. I would like to disagree with you, Mr. Narrator, but we'll go with it. To be continued comes across the screen. Yeah, and that's our episode, and I am going to be perfectly honest, this is not one of my favorite episodes. This episode was definitely chopped together. Like you got I kind of got the feeling the entire time that they didn't quite know where they were going with it. Yeah, and I remember this from when I first watched the series, and I knew this episode was coming. I've never really enjoyed this episode. I mean, we've had a good strain of episodes. I don't think we've had a really a bad one for at least 10 episodes. Right, right. This kind of ended the streak for sure. But, and I know coming on, we are getting way more episodes that are that are going to be good. Like, we have a great episode coming up next week. And if you want to tell us what you thought of the episode, you can make sure to tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot. And I wanted to bring something up because I was brought to light of some confusion we had last episode when we were talking about gypsies and belly dancers. So I wanted to educate some people because someone educated me. And so, Tyler, are you ready to hear this? I'm ready, yes. So Kate Davis, she didn't tweet at us, but she sent me a a message are at the Pokemon snapshot. And it says, as a heads up, Gypsy is viewed as a racial slurf by the Romani. Okay. Good to uh, know. The, the term originates from misidentifying them as Egyptian and also refers to a myth blaming them for Jesus's crucifixion. When it comes to belly dancing, that style is called tribal belly dancing. Uh, Romani prefers to be called Roms or Romani in general. And another our alternate word to use for that style is bohemian. And I told her, you know, I just said thank you for the clarification. As we said, we were trying not to offend anyone if we did, because we honestly didn't know. So, Right. I always love to get educated on different cultures, so I'm glad to hear that. And, uh, you know, I think we even said during that episode that I have no idea what they actually are supposed to be called. I've heard traveler before, too. But uh, I've never actually met a Romani person before, so I had no idea. We don't really have them where we live very much. Yeah, same here. And so that's why I just wanted to make clear that we weren't trying to offend anyone if we did. I, But we love to be educated when, you know, something we say something that's, you know, has been in our vernacular that maybe may not be politically correct. So thank you, Kate, for enlightening us and... For those of you who didn't know as well, thank you for enlightening our list, our listeners. But if you want to also tweet at us, you can tweet us at Pokemon Snapshot or email us at the Pokemon Snapshot at gmail.com. All right, Tyler, have anything else to say? You know what? I- I'm just going to keep it to myself. I, I was going to go on a tangent about this episode again, but I think we get the point. All right, so... Make sure to join us next week when we will be watching episode 22 Abra in the Psychic Showdown. It's going to be awesome watching this showdown.